I'm Todd Gleason. We're joined by extension entomologist from the University of Illinois, Mike Gray. Mike, please tell me about the Bt resistance that has developed in the western corn rootworm. Well, that's right. Uh, looking back over the last several years, we know that uh, the evolution of resistance to the CRY3 BB1 protein uh, has occurred uh, and was confirmed by Aaron Gassman, a professor at Iowa State University, going back uh, to 2011. And Aaron noted that where evolution of resistance occurred, there were several uh, patterns that were fit. Number one, continuous corn in many cases for several years, so non-rotation of, of crops, as well as non-rotation of that particular trait. Um, not long after that, in, in 2012, uh, we began to see, and even actually going back to 2011, we began to see some similar occurrences in northwestern Illinois, uh, Whiteside and Henry counties specifically. And we cooperated with Aaron Gassman at Iowa State University who conducted those plant bioassays for us. Many will probably recall that last year the rootworm season got off to a very early start with adults being reported in western Illinois, Cass County specifically, the first week in June, as well as pretty severe injury to a BT cornfield, again, a field that had been in continuous corn for many years, and a field where the CRY3BB1 uh, protein was being expressed by that particular hybrid. So here we are about ready to embark on another growing season uh, in 2013. Uh, it remains to be seen what this year will look like, but certainly we're keeping an eye uh, open, our eyes open for uh, potential problems that could flare up in producers' fields once again this year. One of the changes that is taking place and will take place in the fields this year is how the refuge for the western corn rootworm is put into place in the field. The 20% refuge are set aside has been available since the beginning, but now refuge in the bag for this year will be the really the big first year of uh, that kind of refuge. Tell me about it, please. We have seen a remarkable, or I should say we will see a remarkable shift in how producers deploy refuges for corn rootworms. Last year, uh, the 20% structured refuge was still the dominant strategy that growers relied upon as their resistance management uh, plan. Uh, and that has been the mainstay for both European corn borer as well as corn rootworms for many years now. 2013, we will see a marked shift in how growers deploy a refuge. And that shift will move very quickly in the direction of a seed blend or the so-called refuge in a bag approach. Based upon 2013 uh, corn and soybean classics uh, surveys that I took back in January, it's uh, very clear that at least those producers who attended those corn and soybean classics are uh, moving in the direction of the 5% seed blend approach and the 10% seed blend approach. And together, when I look at the responses for those two refuge choices, about three out of every four of the producers who attended those regional corn and soybean classic meetings will be using that new approach uh, this coming growing season. Now that we know resistance has developed to BT in the western corn rootworm to yield guard, do you have concerns about of the refuge in the bag at the 5 and the 10% level as opposed to the 20% set aside or refuge area? What's the difference? Um, and does it make much difference that resistance has developed at this point? Well, when we look at the seed blend approach, there are a number of advantages that are very clear. Number one, it ensures compliance. So where we've had concerns about lack of compliance, this approach will take care of that by and large. Number two, because of the way in which rootworms mate and disperse, the seed blend approach from a pure biological, ecological, and, and the manner in which rootworms mate and disperse, there are a number of key advantages using that approach. 
as compared to the structured refuge. Now, going back to where resistance has occurred, where it's been confirmed, probably the primary concern is if you go into those areas where resistance has been confirmed and you're utilizing a pyramid, which allows you to use one of these seed blend approaches. And by pyramid, I'm talking about a BT hybrid that expresses more than a single cry protein that can be targeted against corn rootworms or in some cases against uh, lepidopterans or above ground insect pests. Where resistance has occurred, just one of those cry proteins is really doing the heavy lifting. In other words, the protein that rootworms have developed resistance against, it, it's being expressed, but it's just not effective. And the concern is that we're putting a lot of selection pressure on the one protein, primarily the CRY34 or 35 AB1 protein that's commonplace in a lot of Herculex uh, products. The consequences then may be that the Herculex comes under so much pressure that BT resistance develops, and that may have already begun to happen in some areas of the Midwest, though it's not confirmed. That's correct. So far, we've had no confirmation that the CRY34, 35 AB1 protein, a protein that's commonly expressed in a lot of Herculex products, we have no, no evidence that resistance has occurred to that particular protein. And again, the concern is, even where we've used pyramided hybrids or where growers will be using them this year, because growers are now using primarily the seed blend approach at a reduced refuge level, that that CRY3435 AB1 protein may be under more intense selection pressure because it's at a reduced refuge level and in those areas where resistance to the CRY3BB1 protein has been confirmed, that Herculex type protein 3435 is really doing most of the heavy lifting or protecting those root systems. During the corn and soybean classic series, you also surveyed producers as to whether they would use a soil insecticide in combination with a BT corn hybrid. What were the results? Well, the results were pretty straightforward. Uh, just about on average across all of the locations, not quite 50%, but pretty close to 50% of producers indicated that they intend to use a planting time soil insecticide along with their rootworm BT hybrid uh, this spring. And so that's a pretty sharp increase. And, uh, you know, I think reasons for that primarily include, you know, the current high commodity prices, uh, along with the fact that they have some concern that, you know, uh, BT resistance may be occurring or is just around the corner in their particular area of the state. There were some other factors as well including secondary insect concern. Um, but nearly one in four producers indicated they viewed this practice, that is using a soil insecticide with BT, as simply cheap insurance. So there's you know quite a, f a few producers out there, again, who are going to be moving in this direction uh, this year. I think it's important to reflect and certainly to remind folks that one of the key benefits of registering BT hybrids early on was the fact that the use of these products represented a significant turning point, and that is that we would see large reductions in soil insecticide use. And certainly that occurred for a number of years. Uh, at this particular point, some may find it a bit ironic that we're now surging back pretty quickly in this direction once again. And the benefits of reducing soil insecticide were mostly, I think, to the producer so that they didn't have contact with the insecticides. Were there other things that, that were beneficial for not putting a soil insecticide in place? Well, certainly, uh, you know, when we look at the soil insecticides, uh, these are uh, non-selective uh, compounds, and that is, uh, even though they are being targeted at planting time in narrow bands or being placed in seed furrows, there still are some effects on you know many of the non-target organisms, so-called beneficial insects that are out there. And obviously producers um, that uh, uh, you know had to store and handle these products, uh, so there were some important human health and safety advantages too of not having to rely upon these. I will say that many of the new 
uh, soil insecticide uh, methodologies that can be used now, such as closed handling systems, definitely improve, uh, you know, uh, the application of these products. But then again, too, there's the added expense of using a soil insecticide on top of already higher seed costs that growers uh, have seen over the last, you know, five to ten years. Are there dangers in using both? I think one of the uh, uh, factors that we still need to look at more clearly is how the use of soil insecticides on top of Bt affects the overall uh, development of, of resistance. I think it's commonly voiced uh, that you know adding a, another mode of action would somehow improve the longevity, the durability of Bt hybrids. But I think that question needs to be looked at uh, more clearly. There were studies that are over 20 years old now that suggests that in some cases uh, the addition of soil insecticides as compared with fields that were not treated or plots that were not treated actually saw an increase in the overall adult emergence that, that could occur across a cornfield. So I think it's a mistake to look at soil insecticides and assume that they are population management tools. They, they clearly are not. They do provide an important function, that is, they protect the root system hopefully, from excessive feeding and lodging, which can, you know, result in some pretty significant yield losses. But I think it would be incorrect to look upon them as a class of uh, compounds and say that they, they actually manage rootworm populations. Uh, they really don't. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Mike Gray, Extension Entomologist from the University of Illinois. I'm Todd Gleason.